Welcome everybody to today's webinar. Um, we're going to be talking about compressed air systems today and in terms of uh, getting the sizing right, um, yeah, so we'll be uh, discussing uh, some of the key uh, parameters and specifications, things to be thinking about um, with a few basic examples and then in a couple of weeks time we'll actually delve into some real in-depth um, case studies with all all sorts of gory detail um, building on the material we covered today. Um, so yes, so uh, on that note we'll get underway. So just to very quickly run over what we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about demand profiles first of all, then risk profiles, um, a very quick review of uh, flow measurement units and understanding the differences, um, very briefly sort of uh, talk about uh, the different technology that's available in terms of compressor selection. Um, and then obviously along with that different control um, strategies that can be employed and the pros and cons of those, um, then how that then impacts on our supply envelopes and then discuss a number of case studies. Okay, so just to start off, just a reminder, um, if we're looking at our compressed air supply side of the system, then we must only do that after we've covered and, and, and looked at and optimised and improved our demand side of the program. So obviously we then start with our demand profile which hopefully at this point is our true demand profile as opposed to leaks and artificial demand, inappropriate use and, and, and so on. Um, then of course over the top of that you have uh, some sort of risk profile depending on the nature of the business you're in, um, how critical your systems are, how critical compressed air is to that system, those processes and sort of making sure that you are uh, well aware of all the different possible challenges that you need to be able to face and, and that your system needs to be able to deal with. Then obviously included in that is a number of additional auxiliary um, uh, plant or equipment, things like receivers, filters, dryers in terms of uh, what else you may need. Um, now of course depending on how your air is being used, there's going to be some minimum standards that apply. Now we're not going to talk in too much detail today about the various standards, but it's just a reminder if you're obviously in a food business or a pharmaceutical uh, business, your requirements for your compressed air system are going to be a little bit different to uh, someone perhaps say in a lumber mill or a pulp mill or a steel mill. Um, you know, it really does depend on the nature of uh, the material um, or, or product that you're making and uh, how the air is used. Now, first of all, um, just really to uh, hammer this home um, in terms of demand profile, when you think about um, your, your facility or, or for, uh, production schedule that you're uh, worrying about, um, some of you will have a 24-7 operation, i.e. so 168 hours a week. Now what of course is interesting, if you're sort of more of a, an eight hour a shift, five days a week operation, what um, we need to remind ourselves is that actually only correlates to 24% of the week or 24% of the time. Um, that's before you factor in public holidays and, 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 and so on and all the rest of it. So over an annualised system, if you're only operating one shift a day, five days a week, um, you're only actually doing something productive with your system 24% of the time um, and so of course whether or not you have to leave that system on the other 76% of the time can have a significant impact on the efficiency of your system. Um, now if you go to a two hour, two eight hour shifts a day, five days a week, you get up to 48% obviously. Um, you might then also have parcel shifts where some parts of the plant might run a couple of shifts versus other parts might only be a single shift or you might have some parts of the plant that are a 24-7 operation or a 24-5. So it's understanding that there's different parts of the system that are going to have a different schedule or requirement. Now the other thing to bear in mind is often in a lot of modern systems um, your compressed air system is still required around the clock even though your factory is not running. If your fire system is using compressed air for control valves and the like, um, plant maintenance requirements, they might need compressed air to facilitate tools and other bits and pieces. And so understanding these various uh, impacts and how that changes what you actually need in terms of your demand profile can become very important. Now once you get past all of that and you actually look at your end use of compressed air, um, you know, how variable is your demand? Is there a cyclic load? Are there a number of peak loads? 
it loads intermittent, is it somewhat random? Um, and then sometimes it's important to get past what you think might be random and is actually tied to specific events or operator actions that may or may not be appropriate. So this really comes back to hopefully at this point, if you're, uh, if you're getting to the point of looking at the supply side of your system, you'll have already um, have a pretty good handle of um, genuine compressed air demand versus losses and wastes through the system. Then of course you then get into, once you're understanding your peaks and your, your dynamics in the system, you're then better able to look at your system storage, um, how you might be able to smooth demand with correct location of receivers, both in the plant room itself, next to the compressor, be it wet or dry receivers, but then also point of use receivers next to your uh, high, uh, high loads or duties or intermittent uh, loads and so forth. Now, of course, the other thing you might actually end up looking at is having dedicated localised supply or supplementary compressors. The, now, these might be for, um, you might need a boost in the pressure for a particular part of the plant, but you don't need the whole plant to be running at that high pressure. Um, certainly the packaging game where you're um, uh, um, PET bottle forming and that sort of thing, you might need some high pressure, but does the whole site need to be at that high pressure? Um, so having a dedicated localised uh, compressor to then boost the air that you need to that high pressure could be useful. Uh, another example would be uh, um, uh, spray lances on say a spray dryer for example, you might need or use compressed air to purge those lines, um, but you don't need to have the entire system at a high pressure, you can have a boost pressure or compressor locally. Um, another good example is, as I've already mentioned, fire systems and the like, rather than that being fed by the, um, the, the general system, if you can isolate the system for half the week because you're only a two shift a day operation, five days a week, um, having a dedicated small compressor to maintain the supply of air to your fire system might be a smarter move rather than having a, otherwise too large a compressor running too many hours. Okay, so, once as you work through all of that, you then have to consider the risk of lost production. So how critical is your supply? Now, when we talk about criticality, um, if you take a, uh, a sort of a, uh, a standard generic uh, assessment of this, there's two sides to the criticality equation. There's one of consequence, i.e. if something was to uh, stop, say you lost compressed air, what is the consequence of that in terms of that, what that then causes to fail, be it say a, uh, a, a valve that might fail open, uh, it might discharge a water tank, could uh, create all sorts of issues with uh, um, environmental discharges and the like. Um, so yeah, there's a number of consequences, it might be a safety issue, could be a uh, product loss issue, but understanding the various consequences. And then the other side of that equation is also then the likelihood. Um, and so understanding um, the, the likelihood of certain things happening. Now once you get your head around all of that, of course, then the question becomes is, okay, well how much capacity or backup do we need, i.e. what sort of degree of redundancy do we require? So if we are prepared to have, we might have three compressors on our site and we might use all three of them, um, if we um, can still get through on critical systems with two. Um, if we lose one, that might be tolerable. Um, we might be able to isolate and shut down part of our operation temporarily to get a fix. Or do we need to have one machine as backup to, to allow for uh, well, one extra machine so we can allow for one machine going down? Or is your criticality such that you need complete 100% redundancy? Now the other side of the equation here, you might be thinking, no, no, I don't, I don't need any uh, redundancy, we can, we'll be fine, we'll get through. But what I want you to think about here as well is at some point through the year, your compressor is going to need to be serviced and generally most compressors get serviced every 2,000 hours. So on an annualised basis, if you're a 24-7 operation, your compressor is going to be serviced four times. And in that time, that compressor is going to have to be offline for a, a number of hours. And so what do you do at that point? Um, now, if you're not running all the time, do you pay a premium to have your uh, compressors serviced after hours? Or are you paying a premium to your supplier to do that? You know, so there's all these sorts of equations that you need to uh, work through to understand what your true requirements are. Um, 
Now, if you're a single compressor installation, do you need to have, have that backup if you've got no other choice or option? Um, now, I know many people out there use a, um, a, a high compressor, for example, when a compressor is being serviced. Now, one of the big dangers here, of course, is does the higher compressor or temporary compressor have the same standard of air being produced as the compressor it's being replaced? And the example I'll use here is I'm aware of a number of food factories where they might have a uh, food processing facility there. Their main compressor might be an oil-free uh, compressor with a desiccant dryer um, and obviously all the associated filtering and, and so forth and that looks great. Then of course we're a bit short of air or we need to service the machine so we bring in a higher compressor but the higher compressor is an oil injected screw compressor. Um, probably if, if it even has a dryer might just have a refrigerant dryer. Then of course we run into the trouble, well what does that then do to what's being sent down your system? Are you relying on um, some, uh, some filters and, and so forth? You've got to really understand that uh, it's not just the quality of air that your compressor is doing but what is your backup and what is that going to do in terms of contaminating your system? Now with a multiple compressor installation, um, as we've already talked about, you can have a look at partial or full backup or a number of options. Now superimposed over all of this, we have a number of anxiety factors. Now with a new system, you'll have issues around the danger of overstating demand or, or thinking of future proofing. So thinking, oh yes, but the business is growing, so in the future we might have a little more. So we can be tempted to put an even bigger compressor in. There's many instances that I've been aware of over the years where uh, businesses, um, where businesses uh, um, uh, selling compressors might offer you virtually the next size compressor up for virtually no difference in price. It might be a question of what's available in stock. There's a whole number of reasons and so it's very tempting to think, oh, bigger is better and it's not always the case. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later today. Now, in an existing system, you know, we might have quite a few leaks, um, although we're taking the basis or the view today that we've already addressed those sorts of things as part of the demand side of the system. But ultimately, you're still going to have leaks in your system. How quickly do you fix them? Um, what else can we do to minimise waste? There might be uh, plant upgrades, compressor replacements. Um, compressors do have a life becomes a question where uh, you might have a compressor that's coming up to a major air in rebuild um, and those sorts of uh, high uh, or heavy maintenance uh, upgrades can be up to sort of 60 or 70 percent of the cost of a whole new compressor and so there are moments like that when you're coming up to those events it can be well worthwhile reviewing your system and checking that instead of going like for like is there an opportunity to right size your compressors to meet actually what your system demand is? So for many of you out there with a compressed air system, um, it's not just obviously when you're buying a new compressor, but when it's coming to replace or a, or a major maintenance upgrade on an existing machine, it's a good chance to actually stop and think about uh, making the right decision and ensuring that money that you spend might have an, a, quite an exceptional marginal payback by uh, right sizing the system. Now, on that note, I want to take a, um, um, a, 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 a detour here for a minute and talk about nameplate performance of compressors and talking about the different standards and, and numbers that get bandied around. Um, now, as I do this, we've just had some feedback from one of the suppliers um, who's listening in today. Um, and so thank you, Tony, just sort of commenting that a number of organisations might be uh, offering service intervals of one to 3,000 hours, whereas I've just mentioned 2,000 hours. So um, obviously it pays to check and then I guess it's ultimately up to uh, buyer beware in terms of are you uh, over-servicing or under-servicing your equipment. And I guess that comes back to uh, having a good relationship with your supplier and uh, being very careful with... Uh, what's negotiated in terms of how you do that. So thank you, Tony, for, for that input there. Always appreciated. So um, as we carry on, talking about um, when we're talking about sizing a compressor, everyone talks about, uh, you know, so many CFM or so many cubic metres an hour or cubic metres a minute or litres per second. But of course, air being a compressible gas has uh, um, a, a, a variable property um, 
as a function of both temperature and pressure and of course air is not just air, it has other things in it. Um, so humidity becomes a factor. And so when you read the fine print about the capacity of a compressor, you need to understand the different terminology that's used. Um, some people refer to free air delivery or FAD, other people might refer to normal flow, um, standard flow, actual flow, um, ANR and so forth. And so what we need to understand is what are the differences here and how do you compensate one figure to be able to compare it against another. Um, the other thing of course is so we have a requirement that someone specified is there some anxiety factor on top of that? Are we going to oversize things or have we actually captured it all? Is there a risk that it's undersized? Then of course how much does it actually fluctuate on a fluctuate on a daily or seasonal basis? So here's some terms that we really want to just cover briefly. So standard is is sort of the American term and it refers to 14.4 psi absolute, okay, which is pretty close to to one bar effectively, but 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 15.6 degrees Celsius. Um, now if you go to normal air, that's one bar absolute, zero degrees Celsius, 0% relative humidity, now dry air. Now of course any of you that are familiar with the properties of air, you'll realise that seldom if ever, unless of course you're putting a compressor down somewhere like Antarctica, um, you're not going to have um, zero degrees and 0% uh, relative humidity. And so generally there's always humidity, so even these, these sorts of numbers need to be compensated for. Um, then you've got actual, which is based on a specific reference condition um, that the compressor is using. Free air delivery is actually a volume based on the inlet conditions of the compressor. So the key thing here to realise is that when a compressor is sized, so they talk about the flow rate or the output of the compressor, that's not the volume of air at 7 bar or 6 bar gauge going down the line, that's that air expanded back out to a certain condition, so based on, say for example, if it's normal, it's that air if it was expanded out at one bar, zero degrees and zero percent relative humidity. Um, now the last one down there, of course, which is probably the closest, is the, uh, the, the French term, you love the French, atmosphere normale de reference, which is basically one bar absolute, 20 degrees Celsius, but you'll notice it's the one specification that actually has a relative humidity specified which is a lot closer to the real world. Now, why does this all become important? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take you through a number of scenarios where you can see how much you can undersize or oversize a compressor if you use the wrong numbers. Um, and before we go into this, I, I do want to just share very briefly, there was a site that was built recently here in New Zealand a few years ago where the consultants and the suppliers all kind of uh, mucked it up effectively. And one of the key fundamental assumptions or errors that led to the compressor being undersized was everyone assumed that free air delivery was basically the same as normal air. Um, and of course it wasn't because free air delivery, at, especially in summer, it's at a 20 or 30 degrees inlet temperature um, and a fair bit of humidity. Um, once you compress that air down, it was nowhere near the normal airflow. Um, and you'll see just how much of a difference that can make in just a moment as we go through these examples. The consequence of this can actually be quite dire. Okay, so first of all, if a compressor flow is rated at 20 degrees Celsius, how do we calculate the normal cubic metres per hour flow rate? So remembering, of course, that at normal, we're zero degrees, one atmosphere, dry air. Well, we have a simple temperature ratio in Kelvin, of course, so our zero degrees is 273 and our 20 degrees is 293, we're sort of dropping the 0.15 off the end. And you'll notice that the, uh, the ratio there is 0 0.932, meaning that we'll have to derate our compressor in terms to get our normal cubic metres per hour by 6.8%. And so if you're assuming that your, your flow rate based on 20 degrees, which is how the compressor was specified, is going to be enough, but someone's given you a normal flow rate in terms of your specification, you run the risk of being 70%, 7% sorry, undersized if you're right on the limit. And so you think 7%, not, not too much, no big deal, 
However, if that 7% is what you need and your compressor can't keep up, you will very quickly drop pressure and then can have all sorts of consequences. Now, if you superimpose over the top of that, if we have a poorly ventilated compressor plant room, we might have an inlet temperature that's five degrees above ambient. And so what does that do in terms of the impact of the performance of the compressor? Well, the air's obviously hotter, less dense, so every, um, every uh, bit of air that the compressor's sucking in is going to be that much, uh, every, every litre of air is going to be that much less air in actual fact in terms of mass flow. And so a simple temperature ratio on Kelvin gives you 293 over 298, so 0.983. So therefore, even just five degrees above ambient in your plant room is sort of nearly 2% derating on the compressor. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, if you increase that to 10 degrees, which is very common to see, as you see sort of the temperatures in plant rooms and the like, um, simple temperature ratio again is actually a 3.3% reduction. Now, if you have a mass flow or centrifugal compressor, these, these numbers work out a little bit differently because of the nature of the compressor technology. However, you will still have a drop off in performance. Now, if we start thinking about now humidity, remember we talked about how all of the specifications that you'll normally get in your brochures and the like are all based on dry air. And so if we actually have uh, some humidity, what does that do? Well, what we end up doing is let's take 20 degrees, 65% RH, which is sort of a fairly common occurrence here in most parts of New Zealand. Okay, well, what we actually have to do is we need to use a partial pressure ratio. And so what you actually have is the total atmospheric pressure is a combination of the pressure of the dry air plus the partial pressure of the water vapour. So we can calculate the water vapour pressure, which is a function of your relative humidity. And so you can see you get your 0.65 times the saturation pressure at 20 degrees of water, which is 2.3385 kPa. So in other words, our water pressure or our water vapour pressure if that air is one and a half kPa. And so what happens, of course, is our pressure of our dry air is not 101, it's actually uh, 99. Now, obviously, we could add our 0.325 on our 101 if we, uh, if we wanted to, but we've kept it simple for the purposes of this example. So if you come through, our, our pressure of our dry air is 99.48 out of our 101. So our ratio becomes 0.985. So just that little bit of humidity adds another one and a half percent in terms of the derating of the compressor. So very quickly, if you've got a, uh, a high temperature inlet, um, i.e. you're above ambient because your compressor plant room has not got a ducted inlet, add on to that um, the, uh, the, the higher temperature above your zero, add on to that some humidity, and very quickly all of these percentages accumulate and they multiply, and it's not uncommon to be 10% under what you think you're getting in terms of the sizing of the compressor. So you've got to remember that that water that we've just talked about has to go somewhere, and as we compress it, that's going to actually come out and become a liquid in our line, so having drains or some sort of removal or a uh, dryer um, to capture that and, uh, and, and remove that water becomes important. So correcting for inlet humidity, just once again as another example, if we have 40 degrees, 75% um, RH, um, we've seen this actually on a number of sites where the compressors haven't been uh, thought out too carefully as to where they were placed. And so if you run through those calculations, you'll notice that as our temperature increases, the saturation pressure of the water vapour goes up significantly, and uh, so you end up with 5.5 kPa, you take that away from your 101, and suddenly you can see that ratio starts to get away from us. Now if we then add, so it's over 5.5% there for the humidity correction, we then throw on top of that a temperature correction, we then get a combined correction Okay, which means that our compressor in that environment actually has to be derated by over 17%. So you can see very quickly, it's, it's important to make sure that you understand the impact not only on what the number in the brochure says, but also where you install the compressor can have a massive impact on what you're actually going to get out of that compressor. <coughs> 
Um, so if we talk about ambient pressure, here's another consideration to add on to all of that, is what's the actual intake pressure of the compressor? How do we need to correct it? What's our potential risk and how much can that fluctuate? Now you might be thinking, well, how does it fluctuate? Well, you get a bit of natural variation with your barometric pressure, depending on a high or a, or a low um, pressure cell, um, and that can change very quickly. Obviously through the seasons that might change, but the big one is actually the filter um, elements that you have at the intake to your compressor. If the filter elements are undersized, um, generally they're going to clog up a lot quicker, have a, lot deep, a higher pressure drop and can all impact on the performance of the compressor. So if you consider a uh, inlet filter pressure drop, okay, it's not uncommon to see a standard uh, inlet filter to have sort of a 4 kPa uh, pressure drop. Um, of course that's the cheap installation instead of having a much bigger um, inlet filter bank. Now, in a simple pressure correction ratio, if we take our four off our 101, the actual compressor itself at its intake downstream from the filter is no longer seeing 101 kPa, it's only seeing 97. And so therefore, we've got to derate the compressor simply by 4% just by virtue of the pressure drop across our inlet filter. Now, if we add into that, that we've now got our compressor at altitude, we then need to correct to what happens to our pressure depending on where we are. So I've put some a couple of extremes there where you could actually have a compressor running. If you go down to the coastline of the Dead Sea in, in Israel there, we're actually at minus 400 metres below sea level. So our actual ambient pressure becomes 106 kPa. You could go to sort of say a high altitude of 1,000 metres. Um, we had a plant actually a number of years ago that was at 1,200 metres above sea level and no one thought to compensate for altitude when the compressors were sized and obviously there was a consequence in terms of the performance of the compressors. But to give you an idea, um, there's probably not too many places here in New Zealand. There are a couple with this sort of installation, but you can see it's a substantial drop. Um, if you go to somewhere like Denver in the US, they sort of talk about the mile high city, depending on which part of Denver you're in, as opposed to whether you're actually a mile high or just under, just over but your inlet pressure there is down at 84 kPa. So if you take those three scenarios, doing your pressure ratio, so your 106 over your 101, 90 over your 101, and 84 over your 101, you'll see at the Dead Sea you can actually uprate the capacity of the compressor by 5%. At 1,000 metres, you're going to have to derate by 11%, and in Denver, you're going to have to derate that compressor by 17%. So uh, if you're at sea level, it's probably no big deal. Now in New Zealand, there's probably a number of uh, places like so Taupo um, and uh, some of the ski resorts that uh, use uh, compressors. This can become a significant issue as you start to add, add some altitude on in terms of even a couple of hundred metres can make a difference. Okay, so the other thing to think about is, is the ventilation of your plant room. Is it too hot and what will it do? Um, Here's an example, okay, so we have a compressor intake located in a process area, so this is the 40 degrees, 75% that we've already crunched the numbers on. Um, we add into that a blocked filter because it's wet, there's a bit of debris and because it's wet it's clogged the filter. We have an ambient pressure of 101 and an ambient temperature outside of 10 degrees, 50% RH. So you can work out what the vapour pressure of the water is. So you've got your 50%, so 0.5 times the saturation pressure of uh, water at 10 degrees, which gives you 0.61 kPa. So what we then do is we need to do an inlet temperature correction. So that's our 273 over 313, so it's your 0.872. Your humidity correction, which is your pressure minus the vapour pressure of the water over your pressure. Then you have the inlet filter correction. And then so we have a total correction of a product of the three, so we're down at 0.783. In other words, it's 21.7% uh, down on capacity. Now, of course, if we go back and we actually duct that inlet from outside, preferably here in New Zealand you, on the southern hemisphere, you want to draw that air from the south side of the building where it's obviously cooler and away from the sun in summer. 
we can go back to our 10 degrees, okay, we correct for our humidity, we have a, a better sized inlet filter, um, so we get a total correction 0.95. So an improvement over the two is 21%. So quite substantial, you can do the math, okay. If that was a 250 kilowatt compressor running 24-7, 365 days a year, 21% saving, what does that actually look like in terms of the numbers? Well, we multiply that through, it's just under 460,000 kilowatt hours, if you just take that at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, it's just a tick under $46,000 per annum. Now, to duck that inlet might cost, say for argument's sake, um, $20,000, so you pay back as well under six months. Now, you might have a slightly higher power price, your compressor might be smaller, but you can certainly rework this math very quickly to see how, how significant some of the savings opportunities may well be. Um, you would be uh, surprised, or perhaps some of you wouldn't be surprised, how many compressors are incorrectly installed where there hasn't been the, uh, the, the basic sums haven't even been run to uh, stop and think about uh, what our inlet temperatures are, where our air is being drawn from, and, and so on, and what that actually does to the performance of the compressor. I mean, and this, this saving here is entirely quite common, unfortunately, as sad as that may be to say, um, it's, it's very, very common. Okay, so second case study, so here's a large process air compressor. So a megawatt unit running continuously around the clock, has an undersized inlet filter that was the stock standard inlet filter, okay, with a 4 kPa pressure drop because it's pulling a lot of air through that filter. Now we could increase the size of that filter for $5,000, we might be able to drop the inlet pressure from 4 to 1 simply by doubling the area of that inlet filter, double the area, half the airflow velocity, but because obviously pressure drops the square of the velocity, we actually reduce our pressure drop by 75%. Now what does that do in terms of savings? Well you might think it's pretty minuscule, right, um, 100 over 97. So sort of a 3.1% saving, but remember that's on a one megawatt unit, okay, 10 cents a kilowatt hour, um, it's $27,000 a year, but remember we only had to install a slightly bigger inlet filter. Now you might argue that you could do it for even less than that, um, and certainly if you're in a smaller compressor, it's something to think about when you're installing a compressor at the time you install it, not only will you save this money through the life of your machine, you'll also actually get better life out of your filter elements. They're not going to clog up anywhere near as quick, and as they do clog up, your change in pressure is going to be that much less. So any of you out there thinking about um, your compressors, and uh, go and have a look and see just how big is your inlet filter. And if possible, get someone to measure what is your pressure drop across that inlet filter, and you can start to run this math very, very simply. Um, the bigger the pressure drop across that filter, the harder your compressor has to work. So just real quickly, we're going to talk just very, very briefly today about the different technology available. Um, everyone's sort of familiar with your uh, reciprocating compressors. Um, probably your most common compressor is your helical screw, and then you've got your centrifugal compressor. There's a number of other uh, uh, compressors in terms of variations on your uh, your, uh, your rotary uh, positive displacement, so you've got liquid ring scroll, um, vein compressors, lobe compressors, and the like. Generally, you don't see too many axial compressors um, unless they're sort of in a very uh, specific uh, dedicated use. Now, um, depending on the nature of the application, you're going to use a certain type of compressor, but obviously the predominant one in the market nowadays is the helical screw. Um, you see a few um, reciprocating compressors, but not too many. Now what's interesting, of course, is often overlooked that your reciprocating compressors, especially the old good ones, actually are more efficient than your, uh, your screw compressors by and large. A um, little bit more difficult in terms of getting good installations, uh, noise can be an issue. Um, your centrifugal compressors, compressors tend to be uh, a little bit bigger. Um, they are slightly more efficient typically. Um, provided that they're continuously loaded. Um, there's some sort of special requirements to use them correctly, control them correctly, and so it's something that you need to understand the technology and ensure that you're using it and applying it correctly. 
Um, it's too often we see centrifugal compressors used in a load unload application and that's really not how they're designed and it's going to end up costing you in terms of maintenance. So it's important to understand the different technologies. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on it, but first of all, understand what sort of compressor you have and then you want to make sure that you're using it correctly. Um, now just to give you an idea, when it comes to controlling the compressors, well you need to match supply to demand at some point. Um, and supply is typically sized to match or exceed the peak demand. Now of course if that peak is quite a bit higher than where you are most of the time, we can run into troubles in terms of how the compressor may be on and off and, uh, and, uh, and you end up with a compressor that's quite lightly loaded most of the time which can tend to be uh, highly inefficient. Now in these sorts of applications, typically your system is going to be controlled based on pressure. So if you take your, uh, your pressure, um, depending on the nature of your control, you might be plus or minus uh, half a bar or more, down to sort of plus or minus 0 0.1, 0 0.2 bar. So depending on the nature of your control system, now of course, uh, bigger swings in pressure has a consequence uh, in terms of how closely you can uh, drop your pressure to what you need it to be. Now on a typical um, system pressure control, the question I want to leave you thinking about today is generally most systems are just looking at the discharge pressure of the compressor as opposed to a, a main receiver pressure or a ring or line main pressure or a point of use pressure control. Now of course what happens is, is your change in demand happens out at your point of use and depending on how large or substantial or how long your distribution line is, it could take quite some time for that pressure signal to propagate back to the compressor before it responds. So you need to think very carefully about how the dynamics of the system is going to impact on the pressure in the system and how long your control system is going to respond. Now on that note, just a reminder that obviously the easy way to deal with that is just to run everything at a higher pressure because that's a cheap insurance policy. But do remember that half a bar is going to cost you 3 to 4 percent of your power consumption continuously all year round. And one bar, that sort of doubles to 6 to 8 percent. Now, with a compressor, you can stop start, which is really only, um, only for your real small end compressors. You could use a large receiver, which is a bit like your, your standard little uh, um, reciprocating compressor that you might have at home in the garage. Um, you just have your compressor sitting on your receiver and that's going to come on and off. Now the problem with that of course is that you can only start and stop a motor so many times an hour before it overheats and so generally in an industrial sense you generally have a load unload where the compressor will load but stay uh, running in an unloaded state so that the motor is not having to start again um, and then after a fixed time it might switch off. Um, you could modulate instead so the thing keeps running and you can just either modulate at the inlet or just blow air off that you're not needing. Um, variable displacement, uh, variable speed, um, and then obviously you've got your centrifugal turbo compressors with guide vanes and uh, choke and blow down and, and, and so forth. Um, so each of these strategies has a different, um, it works in a slightly different way and we're going to cover a little bit of that today. Um, but there's a number of energy efficiency drivers that come into the mix. If you've got a load unload compressor running and it's doing a fair bit of running in the unloaded state, all of that energy being consumed is not producing any air which is then going to impact on the specific efficiency of your system, i.e. kilowatts used um, as a function of flow um, generated. Now we can compensate and increase pressures but then obviously that's still not going to stop uh, units from loading and unloading. Now here's an example, if we take the top one, you've got a straight load, then obviously unloading, and so we've got a relatively small receiver here, um, or it might be no receiver, and it's just pumping up the pressure in the line, then it's hitting your, your, your high pressure set point, and the compressor's coming off. Okay, now if we install a receiver or increase the size of the receiver, then we've still got our load unload cycle. If our air use is the same, the, the load is going to be the same, it's just the, the load cycle on the compressor gets extended. So you look at those two scenarios and you think, oh well it really doesn't matter, the power consumed is the same, therefore who cares, let's save our money on the receiver. Now of course a large receiver could cost you uh, twenty or thirty thousand dollars 
here in New Zealand. So it's a significant expense, um, and so you think, well, let's just avoid it, we'll save the money and not worry about it. Um, but what we want to do is we, there, there's a consequence here. Um, you might think increasing the receiver size doesn't actually change the load on our compressor, and to a degree you're right, the actual loaded power consumption of the compressor is just tied to how much air you use. Okay. However, um, what we're going to do is, um, I'm going to jump ahead here, to our uh, power consumption curve. Now on an oil-free compressor, you can see that this is actually a, a true as measured kilowatts uh, um, plot here. You can see that you've got your load cycle here. This is the load actually increasing as the pressure in the system is increasing, and then the unload. Now, for an oil-free screw compressor, um, it, um, it's going to be an unloaded power consumption of about 0.2 of the full, full loaded power. Now, when you go to an oil-injected screw compressor, you'll notice that we've no longer got our nice square curve. We've got quite a, um, a decay here. And the reason for that is with your oil-injected screw compressor, you've got oil and air in a separator vessel. And what happens as you, as you turn the compressor off load, the compressor is still pumping against the back pressure in that vessel, and that vessel has to slowly discharge its pressure. And so what happens is it takes quite some time, and of course you'll notice that the unloaded, unloaded power is actually a little higher at about 0.3 or 30%. The reason for that is that compressor is still pumping oil in the unloaded state, it's just that there's no pressure across the element. So what ends up happening, of course, is we get quite an extra chunk of power in this part of the curve that's not actually producing any compressed air. Now, if we have a very small or no receiver, this line where the compressor starts up can actually end up sitting somewhere here. And so we can end up with... Sorry, I'm not, I'm not drawing this very well. Um, we'll uh, erase that drawing and we'll, we'll try that again. So it's going to decay down, but instead of actually fully decaying, we might load up again, and then we're going to decay down again, and then we're going to load up again, and so on. Now what happens here, of course, is you can see that our loaded power consumption is still the same but our average unloaded power consumption is quite high. This is not 30%, it could be 60 or even 70% of your loaded power consumption. And so on an oil injected screw compressor in particular, the actual, the actual size of your receiver and the amount of storage in the system can make quite a substantial difference to the power consumption of the uh, machine while it's in the unloaded state. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to go back, okay, and so when we're doing a load and unload compressor, we need to understand what's actually happening across that control lot time, and in particular, what's happening in terms of our cycle time. Um, and so you've got to be very, very careful, especially with an oil-injected screw compressor, to make sure that we actually have enough storage in the system so that compressor is actually able to unload fully. Otherwise, our unloaded power consumption is actually going to be quite high. Um, so we obviously want to minimise that unloaded power, and so it's very, very important that we, uh, we, we get that right. Um, and, and there's no substitute for having storage capacity in terms of your receiver. And ultimately, at the end of the day, if it's loading and unloading or, or rapid cycling, um, which we, you know, it's not uncommon to, to go into a compressor plant room and see a compressor loading and unloading sort of inside sort of 20, 30 seconds, which is A, uh, not very efficient, but B, from a mechanical point of view, wreaks havoc on the, uh, the long-term life of the equipment. Okay, so I'll turn it to our load unload. You think, oh gee, unloading and um, running on these compressors is, is incredibly inefficient, so let's not do that. How about we modulate control and again? Well, what happens if we inlet modulate? We're going to use a throttle on the inlet, and uh, what that actually does is it introduces a high uh, 
pressure drop across the inlet to the compressor, which is obviously actually going to increase the required pressure ratio and power usage on the compressor. We could use inlet guide vanes, which will reduce our pressure drop, but it has the same sort of effect. So you can sort of see here, if you've got the open inlet, um, you've got no pressure drop, and then you can start to have quite a substantial pressure drop. Now, the other old way that they can modulate is they can just blow the air off, and in that case, um, all you're doing is making air that you're not actually using, which is just absolutely catastrophic on your efficiency as well. One of the most inefficient forms of control. It's amazing how often you still see this being used. Um, I, I commented earlier about centrifugal compressors or your turbo compressors. The reality is, is those compressors don't like loading and unloading. Um, and obviously one of the solutions that has been used in the past is to just bleed off and, and blow off excess air so you don't have to unload the machine. Obviously, once again, incredibly inefficient. It's very important if you're using centrifugal compressors that they are sized appropriately and used appropriately. Not necessarily the most effective trim compressor, depending on their size. Um, you have to be very, very careful that they are matched to the load and that uh, the turndown capacity of the units is, is adequate to meet your demand variation or you've got other ways of, of supplementing that with um, um, some alternative uh, compressors. So very, very important to get that right. It's going to cost you substantially in terms of the modulation control. So really all of this comes back to when you're specifying your system and getting your sizing right, there's no substitute for understanding your demand profile. And it's very, very important that you understand how you're actually going to control the compressors in an efficient um, and stable manner. Now, variable displacement compressors, they obviously have an outlet um, from the screw which is adjustable, which effectively changes the, uh, um, the uh, capacity of the unit, um, which can lower your power consumption. At very, very low um, turndowns, um, the efficiency does start to drop off. However, they can be quite an efficient unit. Um, variable speed units, obviously proportional speed control, um, slightly, slightly better efficiency at low end speeds, you can get slightly better turndown. Um, you do have thermal losses from the VSD, higher initial cost. And the big thing that gets often overlooked is it introduces quite a number of additional modes of failure. Now, we're not going to go into that today. We covered that briefly in our VSD webinar a number of weeks ago. But, but these are all issues to bear in mind in terms of your, your, your preparedness to expose yourself or introduce additional risks to your system. Now, the VSD technology these days is fairly robust, provided, of course, you're using a reputable supplier. Um, it's just another example out there today of um, counterfeit or, or substandard or poor quality equipment being substituted to save costs as part of the supply chain. And this equipment's a very, very important. Understand who you're buying the equipment from, where it sources, understand that supply chain. It becomes very, very important. Or you may, may unwittingly be introducing uh, additional failure modes into your system with a substantially different uh, risk to what you might envisage. Now, most of those failure modes that, um, that I'm talking about there are, are addressable. But once again, if you're not on top of your procurement or someone in procurement's decided they can save a bit of money, um, if they're not on top of some of those details, they could be unwittingly introducing some substantial uh, um, risks to your business. Just to give you a comparison here in terms of efficiency, um, blue is your standard load unload screw compressor, green is the same compressor fitted with the VSD. You'll notice at the top end that the power used is actually slightly higher, and the reason for that, of course, is you've got your losses across your VSD. Now, the red, of course, is your modulation, and so you can see, depending on where your compressor is predominantly sitting, depends on what's obviously going to look, and you'll notice that at no time is the modulation a smart move, just to be clear. Um, obviously, lower loads, the VSD comes into its own. Now, um, for those out there that are thinking, hang on a minute, what about your other um, compressors um, that, that might have... Uh, um, variable displacement. Yes, they uh, also come into their own here, and this is where you can start to split hairs and have a conversation. 
um, a comment's just come through from one of the suppliers in the business um, in, in, in terms of that. So I really uh, thank you, um, uh, Campbell, appreciate the comment. Um, I'm not going to get into a debate today about the various suppliers and technologies we try and keep it vendor neutral. Um, but the key thing is, is understand that the, uh, when you're looking at the specification of a compressor, it's not just the headline number at 100%. Understand what that profile looks like through the full range of uh, operation of the system and be particularly careful in terms of the turn down as to what's promised as opposed to what might be delivered. Um, once again, if you're using reputable suppliers, um, you should be okay, but be very, very careful. Um, but uh, don't be afraid to sort of say, well, uh, you know, if you're in the procurement game getting one of these compressors, you know, make sure that you have um, acceptance standards as part of your project. Um, you know, measure it and actually verify that the system's doing what was promised. Um, you know, it, it's always interesting when you uh, talk to uh, the suppliers and when you go from what's in the brochure versus actually have them sign up to deliver a agreed performance spec. Um, it's interesting how things change. Uh, I know there's a number of instances where compressors actually get derated or they put a bigger motor on all, all because actually all, we need to make sure that we deliver this and, and suddenly the risk profile changes a little bit. Now, bear in mind if you play that game, then you can expect to pay a premium on the cost of your unit, but I guess it's back to the same old adage, you get what you pay for. So if you want to talk about a single compressor installation, um, you've got key parameters that you need to be worrying about, so the demand profile, understanding the size of your peaks, the storage requirements, um, end use pressure requirements, distribution pressure drops, supply side pressure drops so across your dryer, your filters and so forth, and then obviously how that all relates back to your discharge pressure at the compressor. Now, when you go to a multiple compressor installation, um, you might have a single plant room which keeps it fairly simple. Same as for a single compressor, other than the fact that you now got to start looking at the envelope of how your multiple compressors um, are going to be loaded up. Does it give you a stable supply envelope? Um, can you actually control the compressors to deliver or match your demand requirements? Um, how do you actually have intelligent control? Now, um, we're going to sort of, you know, talk very, very briefly about this today, but what we're going to do is we're going to cover it in more detail in two weeks' time when we get into some in-depth uh, case studies where we'll talk you through some some little, uh, I guess, real-world examples as to how you deal with um, how you size and control compressors based on a certain number of demand profiles. Now, when you have multiple compressors with multiple plant rooms, things get a little bit more complicated. Um, especially if the systems are interconnected. Um, do you have single control or is it independent control? Um, do the compressors service different, different plants with different uh, profiles, different shifts? Some might be 24-7, others might be uh, limited shifts. So you need to pay particular close attention to what's happening to your system pressure. And of course, where you've got interconnected systems, be aware that you the flow might not be going the way you think it's going. It could be negative, or negative in inverted commas, or reversing as to based on high pressure, low pressure, the flow was always going to go from high to low. And as compressors um, are working, they might not always be working together. They could start fighting one another. And so you can have multiple compressors loading and unloading and competing with each other. And so it becomes very, very important to, to get that right and understand what's actually happening in the dynamics of the system. Um, so sometimes it's best to combine systems, look at how you control things. You might actually base load a machine and, and leave it uh, locked in place and then have the uh, other plant room doing the primary control. Um, so it becomes important then of course getting your distribution right, getting your storage right, um, understanding how things uh, vary through the day um, and through seasonal variations if required. So the other thing to important to remember when it comes to multiple compressors is when it comes to sizing, the, the common, I call it a mistake, um, but the common scenario that's often used is if I'm going to have three or four machines, I like them all to be the same because it keeps my spares requirement all consistent. 
So uh, we, we can have flexible run order, we can ro rotate through and everything can have the same number of run hours on it so my compressor man can come out and service them all at the same time um, and so it can be great. I often call this the poor man's VSD. Um, there was an example a number of years ago in Asia where there was a site that needed um, about 10 megawatts of compressed air and of course what was interesting is, as things get done over there, um, the, uh, the supplier of choice, I won't go into the details as to why they are the supplier of choice, um, but the biggest machine they could supply was 250 kilowatts. So the consequence of that is they had to supply 40 250 kilowatt compressors. Now of course what's interesting about that is you can imagine 40 machines all had to be maintained every couple of thousand hours. Um, obviously it was great for spares, you could uh, um, actually uh, um, ensure that you had enough spares just purely by, by virtue you had so many machines. However the problem is, is you actually ended up paying a fortune in maintenance instead of having appropriately sized equipment and technology. Um, so yes, it can be considered a poor man's VSD, but it's often the uh, often the most expensive uh, way to go about it. So with that, um, I know that's an extreme case, but understand what your true total cost of ownership is. It's a number of sites here in New Zealand where instead of having a couple of decent, appropriately sized compressors, there's sort of 15 compressors across the site. You know, there's an incredible increase in the maintenance cost and the capital cost never mind the energy that comes from multiple machines being controlled and loading and unloading and, and not uh, fully meeting the requirements of the site all that efficiently. So it's important to get that right and as you start to understand those true total costs over the life of the system, it, it should justify doing a number of other things. So generally, there's some considerations to think about is you want to have stable control leads to stable pressure. You want to increase storage to enable smaller pressure control ranges. You want to have smaller pressure control range so that we can increase our efficiency. We can watch our cycle times, especially on all injected screw technology, um, when they're running in a load unload situation. Um, line pressure control is a lot more effective than compressor discharge control. You do need to be careful how you set that up. Um, you need to also consider alarms if filters get blocked and, and other issues but think through what you're trying to control your system, um, what you're trying to achieve and what you need to do versus the, the stock standard out of the box solution. So just to finish off, I want to share with you an example of a plant that was a large site, two shifts, five days a week, so it's 48% of the, of the year or 48% of the week. However, they then had night and weekend maintenance. It was an older site, had plenty of leaks and redundant lines high peak loads and uh, the last 10 to 15 percent of capacity was used less than three percent of the time. Okay, total available savings was over 25 percent. Well here's their demand profile over sort of a two and a half week period and you can see here if I highlight here's our working week, you can see each of our nights where our demand's dropping off, then you can see our weekend here where you've got sort of a base leak level. Now what we do is we'll turn that over, we'll just uh, delete those drawings. You can see that we have a base leak level, obviously they were clever enough to turn the system off part of the time, okay, however there was quite a chunk of time, this 48% where they're not actually producing anything, we've got a leak rate with compressors loading and unloading, and then we've actually got a small amount of air being used for maintenance. Now here's our 3% of the time where we've got a bit of a peak load. Now to give you an idea, this site was, uh, was being uh, supplied by four 250 kilowatt compressors. One of those was effectively just supplying leaks. <coughs> Excuse me. The, uh, there's a substantial amount of power there in the 48% of the time when the plant's not being used. Now what was interesting is, is we did pose the question that why can't the maintenance guys, uh, do they need to use the air for all of that? And they said yes, they needed the air for some tools and, and all the rest of it. And we turned around and said given the nature of the site, um, how about we have some localised um, little air compressors where they can run their power tools and do what they need to do. And sort of the payback was sort of quite substantial. Now as it turns out, 
when we went back and looked, those little portable air compressors were actually already there and distributed across the site. They just weren't being used. And so there was a substantial power saving with actually no capital required whatsoever. It was just being smart enough and having the uh, organisational discipline to say, no, we're not going to leave our entire compressed air system just so the maintenance guys can uh, not have to get the local um, compressor for their part of the plant that they're working and they actually had over 20 of these compressors scattered through the plant for that purpose, they just stopped using them. So obviously a few management changes and everything else um, was able to, uh, to put that back into place. Um, but you can see here that uh, we've got a fairly uh, substantial variation in demand and so having the ability to meet that demand um, there were some significant savings in terms of getting the compressors more appropriately sized to meet that and, and improve the control of the system. So uh, in two weeks time we're going to go into a lot more detail um, and go through some uh, in-depth case studies and go through from the actual data itself and how you analyse it and how you delve into identifying what these opportunities are, um, building the savings and uh, and, uh, and and so forth. But uh, for the purposes of today, just to, to, to recap and surmise, compressor performance is adversely affected by temperature, humidity, inlet pressure losses and altitude. And please, if you get nothing else out of today, um, go away with an appreciation that free air delivery or your flash numbers in the brochure from the compressor supplier are not necessarily the same as the normal flow rates that are on your PNID or, or, or plant specification sheet. So you need to ensure that all ambient conditions are accounted for when sizing any new or replacement compressors, especially altitude, temperature, humidity, and obviously also making allowances for water removal. Um, you need to match your supply envelope to your demand profile um, and we're going to go through that in depth in two weeks' time. Um, you need to understand your system control options because they will directly impact on your system efficiency. So it's very, very important to remember that uh, the sizing and a key part of that sizing is understanding how you're going to control what you're putting in. So sizing is not just how many kilowatts, it's also how you're going to control those kilowatts. Um, so just as a reminder, um, in two weeks' time, we're going to uh, cover some in-depth case studies. We're really going to delve into this in, in detail with some specifics. Um, so just as a reminder, um, so that's it on the 27th of July. Then upcoming webinars, the 10th of August, um, the 24th of August. So 10th of August, we've got pumps with uh, Martin looking at flow control of pump systems. Then we're going to look at um, fan system duct design and troubleshooting. In August 24th and September the 7th, we'll be looking at water hammer and steam and condensate systems. So the links uh, will be available on our website um, over the next few days, and then obviously your past webinars will be under the Eco Business YouTube channel. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today. We'll stay on the line for any of you that might have some questions or some scenarios that you want to float or uh, put to the group that we can discuss. Happy to do that right now or alternately you can flick me an email and we can have a discussion offline if you wish. Um, just as we're waiting for anyone that might throw through a question or two, um, just a reminder that your ECA uh, business program, you've got an account manager out there that will be more than happy to help with uh, progressing anything that today's webinar might have prompted you on. Um, if you're looking for some additional help and resources, there's some available on the ECA business uh, website. Um, and a reminder that the webinar schedule for the future is, is available on our website, energyefficiencynz.com. Um, so yes, yeah, so we'll stay online for a couple more minutes if any of you do have a question. Um, otherwise, like I said, feel free to, uh, um, to flick questions through or, or drop me an email um, offline after the webinar today. So thank you very much for, for tuning in. And like I said, we'll give you a minute or two more. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there.
Alrighty. Um, okay. Uh, okay. No, thanks very much for the feedback you guys are sending through. I'll, I'll give you guys a, uh, a minute, a couple minutes more if any of you have questions. Um, like I said, feel free to email them through if you're a little bit shy. Um, feel free to drop me an email and we, we can have a, have a discussion later on. All right, well, uh, on that note, we'll sign off. Um, and like I said, uh, stay tuned for the recording, which will be available over the next couple of days. Um, and like I said, any other questions, feel free to uh, send, me a, send me a point.